One evening in the middle of a long winter, when the snow outside was deep and the winds howled, the old woman told her grandson the story of the dear woman. Grandson, she began, I have something to tell you. That's how some old people began their stories. You are learning to be a hunter, and to be a good hunter is a good thing. A good hunter provides for his family so that there can be food to eat and good clothing to wear. I know you will be a fine hunter, and I also know you will hunt alone many times. When you are alone hunting, there is something you must watch out for, something beside the animals like the bear and the great cat who can hurt you, something besides the enemies who come into our country now and then. Sometimes the danger waiting out there is not just that your body might be injured or wounded. Sometimes the danger is for your spirit, too. Men are sometimes wounded in battle, or they are hurt while hunting. Those wounds or injuries can heal, but your spirit is a different thing. If your spirit is hurt, sometimes it can never be well. My husband, your grandfather, told me of something that I heard of when I was a little girl, something out there, always waiting for hunters. He saw her, he told me, when he was a young man, before he became my husband. Maybe you will see her, too. The dear woman waits out there, grandson. When you are a young man and a hunter, and you go out alone, she might appear to you. When you are tired and hungry, and very far from home, perhaps when your hunt has not been good, she will come to you. She is the most beautiful woman any man has seen. Those that have seen her say so. Her hair is shiny and hangs to her ankles. Her eyes are large and sparkle with a light that beckons. And her smile can turn the strongest man into a foolish boy. Her lodge is always pitched nearby with a fire inside and soft robes. She will invite you in to drink tea with her, to rest. Do not go near her, grandson. Do not go near her lodge. Some men have, and their spirits were taken by her. They went into her lodge with her, and they rested. They lay with her as if she were wife to them. When they woke up, they found themselves alone. The lodge was gone, and she was gone. They had known her. They had lain with her, the most beautiful woman they had ever seen. And she was all they could think of. When this happens to a man, young or old, he forgets his family and goes looking for her, the dear woman. But he can never find her, no matter where he looks. No matter how far he travels, he can never find her. Such a man goes looking for the dear woman, he tells himself, because she is so beautiful that he must have her. But he is really looking for his spirit because she has taken it from him. A man who has lain with her is never the same. He is always restless. So when you are a young man, grandson, and you are hunting alone far from home, and you come across the most beautiful woman you have ever seen, you must turn away. If you go with her, she will please you, and she will give you pleasure, but she will also take your spirit from you, and you will never have it back. It may be the most difficult thing you will ever do but you must turn away from her. Koshkalaka did grow up to be a fine hunter. He was the best hunter in the village, as a matter of fact. He never failed to provide for his family and for those who were needy. It was said of him that when he left the village on the hunt, two things would be for certain. He would not return empty-handed, and he would be gone for many days. One autumn... Soon after his grandmother had died, Koshkalaka made preparations for a hunt. He told his mother and father he would travel with three other hunters, and they would be gone longer than usual, because it had been a dry summer, and the animals were closer to the big river far to the north. The hunters reached the big river and set up their camp. They hunted the deep gullies and draws that cut down into the river's banks. They were successful but they had to use every skill they knew because the deer and elk were not so plentiful as they usually were, 
and they seemed especially wary. Because the hunters were so far from home, they also had to dry the meat they had killed. As the days were on, they grew tired and were anxious to go home. Just before sundown one evening, Koshkalaka tracked a bull elk to learn the trail the animal used each day. He was certain he could bring it down the next day if he waited in ambush at a good spot. As he headed back for the hunting camp, he smelled smoke from a fire and decided to see if enemies were about. Sneaking carefully down into a wide gully, he found a lone teepee, a lodge, pitched in a grove of oak. It was a fine lodge, but a small one, and Koshkalaka wondered if others had come to the big river valleys to hunt. As he watched the lodge to see who might return to it, a woman came out and looked in his direction. He waited, but he could see no one else. The woman waved and walked toward the plump thicket he was hiding in until she was very close. You must be very tired. Her voice was soft and soothing. Koshkalaka stepped from the thicket and a shudder went up his back. Standing before him was the most beautiful woman he had ever seen in his life. There were several beautiful women back in his small village, but their beauty next to this one was like the dim glow of a campfire next to the brightness of the moon. I have a fire. It is warm in my lodge, and there are robes to rest on. Come, she said, her eyes beckoning, and filled with promises a young man could not mistake. Koshkalaka knew who she was, of course. Standing a few steps from him was the dear woman. All the stories he heard were true. She was so beautiful that he couldn't take his eyes from her. Her hair was as black as night and hung to her slender ankles. Her hands were small and delicate. Her eyes were deep, deep brown and very large with thick, long lashes. A man could get lost in him. A soft smile curved her full lips upward and there was the slight scent of rose hips as if her finely tanned dress had been rubbed with the flowers. I know you are tired, she went on, smiling. Come into my lodge and rest. Hoshkalaka trembled. There was something more to this creature before him, and he could feel it. He was afraid, but he was also tempted. He wanted to follow her, to take her into her lodge. She turned and walked away for a few steps her slender body swaying, her long hair swinging with the fringe of her dress. She stopped and turned to Hoshkalaka. You are strong, a fine young man, she murmured. I am looking for a young man such as you. I have been waiting for you. Come. Hoshkalaka's legs seemed to have a mind of their own. Before he knew what was happening, he was walking toward the dear woman, his hand reaching out for her outstretched hand. But a heartbeat before his hand touched hers, he stopped. No, he said, pulling his hand back. I will not go with you. Yes, you must, she replied, her voice soft and low, her eyes leaving no doubt as to her meaning. I need you. Koshkalaka was a strong young man, strong of body and of mind. It took all of that strength to turn away from the dear woman. It was the voice in his head that helped him, a voice that said, It may be the most difficult thing you will ever do, but you must turn away from her. No, Koshkalaka said again, I will not go with you. My grandmother said that I must turn away from you. I will not go with you. Leave me alone. Dear woman's beautiful face quickly twisted into an angry sneer. She stamped her feet and snorted. Her mouth moved, but she could not speak. A cold wind suddenly sprang up, scattering the leaves in the gully. Koshkalaka was afraid, and he turned to run. Leaves rattled all around him, and he heard a whistling snort, the sound deer made when they were alarmed. Looking back, he saw a deer standing where the deer woman had been. It was a female blacktail, with a dark stripe across its face. He had never seen such a black stripe across the face of any deer. Koshkalaka noticed something else. 
the dear woman's lodge was gone. The deer lowered its head to charge. Koshkalaka put an arrow on his bowstring and raised his bow to take aim. The deer spun and disappeared into a line of sumac. Never again in his life would Koshkalaka see such a deer, although he would always be on the lookout for it, for her. He never saw the dear woman again, for as long as he lived. Koshkalaka returned to the hunting camp and told his companions what had happened. He told them he had seen the dear woman. They believed him, because there was something different about him. There was a look of strength in his eyes. We must build the sweat lodge and pray, he told them. So they did. A low, round lodge made of willow and covered with deer and elk hides. That night they heated stones and made a sweat to purify themselves and to pray for good things to happen. In the days that followed their hunting was good. It was very good. Soon they had plenty of meat to take home. In time, Hoshkalaka courted a young woman from another village and won her love. They married and had a son and a daughter. Over the years, not only was he the finest, most skillful hunter to come along in many a generation, but he was also a stalwart warrior and a leader of men. Men were willing to follow him on the warpath or on the hunt, because he had a calm manner and strength of spirit. And when he was an older man, he took his place on a council of old men, and there he was known for his wisdom and good advice. The dear woman couldn't fool Koshkalaka because of one thing, respect. Koshkalaka loved and respected his grandmother, and because he did, he remembered her words during that awful moment when the dear woman almost took him. If he hadn't respected his grandmother, he would not have remembered what she had told him. Perhaps the dear woman doesn't appear to lone hunters anymore, or perhaps she does in other ways. Times have changed for us, so maybe she's changed her ways too, and comes after our spirits in other ways. I can tell you one thing. You're never too old to remember the things your grandmother taught you. It's never too late to respect the ways of our elders. It's never too late to remember what Grandmother said.